All right, everybody, I think we'll get started. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning, interrupting the Seahawks game here that started an hour ago. Probably everybody's uh, going back and forth, right? So uh, today's Hellebores, uh, great perennial to talk about here as we get into the winter season. Uh, we've got bloom coming, um, One of my certainly one of my favorite plants. I am uh, Trevor Cameron, our general manager here. Say hi to Nicole, she's in the background with hi. all the pretty fall trees behind her on the green screen. <laughs> We'll have to play where in the world is Nicole here one of these classes. We can all guess, guess for a prize or something. So thanks again for joining us. Um, I thought we would just kind of start by maybe talking a little bit about uh, what I might call the evolution of hellebores. Um, certainly a plant that I can remember my grandmother having, my mother having. Um, I have a number in my own yard. I remember shopping for them uh, going back to the Northwest Flower and Garden Show beginnings with Mr. Dan Hinckley. Um, you know, we kind of went from uh, everybody has a white blooming hellebore to uh, every year there seems to be new colors, double flowers, spotted foliage, uh, lots more selections for gardeners. It's a great perennial um, and you've got a, a, a plethora of choices as far as flowers and doubles and different foliages and variegation um, and bloom times. Um, you know, first hellebores are starting to bloom here about now in that November, December time frame, we would have color uh, all the way into March and April on some other varieties. So certainly a, a truly a good uh, winter perennial. Um, I can remember Flower and Garden Show about uh, mid nineties, uh, hanging out with my mother down there and, and seeing the old Heronswood booth and purchasing a four inch double hellebore for $25, which I still have in my yard. And she still has hers because I got her one. I remember it was Valentine's day. So I bought two for 50 and I thought, what am I crazy paying that much for a plant? Of course, the next year, two years went by and all those cool new hybrids that he was doing and now a number of other folks are, uh, the prices come down um, and frankly, you can pay less today than I paid uh, 25 years ago for that first double. So um, lots of really cool plants. I'll show you a few. Uh, we'll talk about some care today. I've got a few slides I'll show you towards the end and we'll certainly leave uh, plenty of time for questions as well. So if we kind of start out, um, you know, hellebore to me is a year round plant. You know, we did uh, winter interest uh, here a couple of weeks ago for our class. That was certainly mentioned in there, but specifically the hellebore is, is a perennial. They're super hardy up here in the Northwest and something that will stay evergreen, nice and clumpy growth. But again, I would get flowering. The, ours first few are just starting to bloom and the majority of them Christmas, January, February, March. So. Sometimes we call them Christmas rose, Lenten rose. They've got a bunch of different uh, different names on them. Uh, certainly, if you look at your sheet, I hope everybody got one on the net. If not, let us know. There's a link on our website to it. Um, this will have some good general information, and it will also list, you know, kind of the, the four main species we're talking about today. Um, many hellebores over the years have been crossed and hybrids um, nowadays. Yes, you can still find some of those straight species around, but a lot of the plants that we find um, at a great nursery like Sunnyside are hybrids of different species or, or bred into grouping. So we'll talk a little bit about collections here a little bit later. Um, drought tolerance is one of the first thing that comes to mind uh, with hellebores. I don't like watering a lot in my own yard. I think people life saving water these days. You know, I would essentially walk away uh, from a hellebore planting, except for the heat of the summer with occasional irrigation. We're not going to need to water these guys much uh, long term in our yard because they're so drought tolerant. As long as I've got good drainage, I can use that as a really nice kind of woodland, part shade, part sun, shade, perennial that I can put underneath trees. You know, I've got old evergreens. You've got kind of dry shade area. That's an excellent choice to mix into those kinds of gardens where we can uh, utilize the hellebores, enjoy the foliage um, and the winter bloom. Um, I think they'll take more sun than you think. Um, I've got some at my house uh, for 20 years that get sun up, you know, till two, three, four o'clock in the afternoon in the summertime. And I don't have leaf burn. I've got no issues with extra water. They're good for shade or part shade, but I think you'd be surprised uh, most all of them um, you know, maybe not all day 100% sun, but I think they'll take a little more sun than, than most people give them credit for. Um, you know, fertilizing, if I kind of go through the, you know, the sequence um, of what I do to mine during the course of the year, um, you know, fertilizing comes to mind first. 
when I walk out, you know, just around the holidays, um, I'll typically feed my hellebore sometime in that January, February, March time frame to get them going early in the season. Um, I use a lot of mulch or compost up to my crown, so I will just scrape that mulch away, put a nice rim of good organic uh, rose and flower food from E.B. Stone. That's a great food. I'll put a little bit of that down, cover it right back up with the mulch, and then off we go. So if I feed coming in out of that, you know, kind of going into winter, middle of winter, and then maybe I do one more dose um, later spring, that should pretty cover me for the year. That second feeding in that May, June time frame would help me with bud set, a little nicer foliage over the summer, and I probably get rewarded with a little bit more bloom as we get into that next season, okay? Uh, pruning. You know, I cut all of mine back once a year. You know, I think some people um, that talk about uh, hellebores and maybe have had issues with them, it tends to be the bugs that hang out underneath the foliage in the in the cold of the winter. If I'm a little white fly aphid little creature, I'm going to find a nice warm sheltered place that I want to hang out and keep my kids alive till the next season. So I'm going to find something like a hellebore, big palmate leaves that I can hide out underneath, stay sheltered, have some sugar to, to eat in the winter and then boom we go back to spring and you get more so to me walking out that one time a year you know I, I walk out right at christmas to new year's and i will go to my clumps of hellebore take my pruners and i will cut every single leaf off at the ground level let them start over again i get rid of all those leaves into the yard waste i start with fresh green foliage and because they're just starting to bloom now i can really see the flower sometimes to me an older hellebore with all the foliage, you see the flowers poking out here and there, but I'd rather see that whole brand new crown come out each year. So I choose to cut mine back once a year. And then again, as we go through the season, you know, certainly if I have a leaf that's bad or off color, um, I have young boys, if the boys step on a leaf and I have to cut it off, then it comes off in the summer, but we can kind of maintain that the, the nice, fresh, healthy, green look all through the season that way with just that one annual prune in the winter. Uh, this is the time of year um, as we head into winter that we want to transplant, divide, um, all those things as gardeners we want to accomplish here in the dormant season. Uh, with hellebores, it might be a little trickier because, you know, as a general rule, I would tell folks go out and divide or transplant your perennials, you know, any time during the dormant season. But because these little guys bloom in the winter, I would rather have you get your divisions done and dividing and transplanting done here before they bloom. So if you've got ones that flower Christmas, January, try to get it done here in the next couple of weeks. Um, it's you no, know, not the end of the world. You wouldn't lose the plant. But I think sometimes if you walked out and tried to do it in March and February when it was in flower, you might lose some of that flower power just for the season as they get moved. So try to get your dividing uh, transplanting done here over, over, the, over the next little bit before they bloom. Um, I mentioned bugs real quick. You know, again, the foliage is the main issue. Um, we don't have to get murder, death, kill. We don't need systemic. Um, there's a lot of good green organic choices that we can use to take care of simple bugs like white flies and aphids. I brought in one, the super insecticidal soap from Bonide. We could use neem oil. There's a lot of choices of something very natural, organic that we can use for those simple uh, insect infestations to get them off of there. Uh, heading into the next season. Uh, diseases, you know, I don't see a lot on hellebores. The one thing uh, I would watch for is what we would call hellebore blight. So if you've got a plant that maybe you see some black splotches on the foliage or we see blackening on the stem, sometimes if, it, if it's left unchecked for a season or two, you may have some whole leaves that shrivel down to the crown. Um, that is something we do want to spray for. Make sure if you do see that happening on yours, typically it's in the wet winter time. Um, to me, it's always a sign that maybe the drainage isn't the best and we might have to get him raised up or transplanted into a little, little uh, higher, drier spot. But if we have that happen, you know, for me, again, I would rather remove the bad foliage. We don't want that on there anymore anyway. Sometimes it's removing all of the leaves down to the crown to get rid of it. And then especially coming out of winter, we would get a nice fungicide like funganil. Um, there's a number of other ones that we could use that we would spray the foliage that's left and make sure we saturate the crown. So where all that leaves and the flowers are coming out of, we would want to make sure we really get that ground space sprayed so that we don't have the spores and we don't have to continue the infection 
as the, as the, the foliage for 2021 comes out as well. Okay. Um, one, one thing I'll, I'll kind of chuckle as I say, if you've had hellebores in your yard for a while, you know what I mean when I, I might ask you to seed or not to seed. That is your question to answer. Because hellebores, you know, the, the flowers are awesome. They last for months, but I like them dried as well. So I don't go out and maybe deadhead mine, you know, right when they're done blooming per se. But you get some nice color change as they dry all the way into the summer months. So if I leave those flowers on there, Inevitably, my purpose as a plan is I want to sow myself and make some more of me. So I'm going to drop those seeds. And if you've got viable soil, typical good, good earth around here in the Pacific Northwest, I'm going to have some of those seeds sit for a year and then sprout out that next season. So A, I can get some more plants if I want. Uh, sometimes they'll form a pretty good mass on some of the varieties. If you're maybe a little tidier gardener and you want your clump here and clump there and clump there, that we would just get towards that end of spring and make sure we reach out into the crown and just deadhead out those flower stalks. And then we don't have to worry about any, any seeding at all. So you can go, go either way. Um, the last thing I'd mentioned kind of about growing them is in containers. You know, this is the time of year, a couple months back here, I taught the, you know, the fall container class. We always talk about, you know, the thrillers, the spillers and the fillers, you know, different types of things that we can use in our containers. You know, hellebore being A, evergreen, and B, B, blooming in the winter, it's an excellent choice to add to your winter container. So if I want something added to my pot that I can keep for a number of years and then move out into my landscape, hellebore is a great choice. We carry a lot of quartz-sized plants, so a little bit less cost uh, up in our container department with our seasonal plants. It's the same thing as buying a gallon. Maybe I want a little larger one that I use in my landscape but I can tuck a quart into a nice container a little easier, get bloom right away that first year. I have nice foliage to look at all winter time, but I've got something I can have for two, three years in a container before I, I transplant it out in my yard um, and have another, a plant to last out there for a number of more years. So, so don't forget about using them in containers. Um, we're gonna look at a, a couple of slides here I'll share in just a moment, but um, as I bring up plants and, and show you some pictures on the slides, um, you know, yes, the flowers are outstanding. We're, we're just starting to bloom now. You'll see some ones in full bloom in the slideshow. But look at the foliage, too, because I think most people don't realize how cool some of the newer ones are. I've got reticulated marbled colors on top of green. Uh, there's some great variegated varieties around um, that we can utilize again. So when they're not in bloom, you know, in the summer, I've still got a very attractive perennial that I can use in my, in my border. So uh, take a look at the foliage. And then again, the flowers, you know, you pick any color in the rainbow these days. You know, back in the day, it was some white, a little bit of pink maybe. I mean, I can go all the way from white, pink, red, purple, almost to black. I can get into yellows now, peaches, orangey colors, um, all kinds of variation in both single and double flowers. So take a look at some of the pictures and I'm sure something will catch your eye here. So give me just one second. And I am going to share the screen here. Okay, so there's me. We don't need to keep it on that one. But here's a couple. Um, if you look at your list um, that we sent down, um, that you can get up, get on our website again. If you look at some of the species on there, Fetitus is a little bit different. Um, hellebore. I've got a plant here I'll grab. Um, this has got kind of more of a little split leaf. You can see that same clumpy growth habit. This would be a spring bloomer, okay? It's got a nice little light smell to it as well. Um, one thing you'll see with these, deer will not touch them. So we have a lot of folks around here that are asking for plants that the deer won't browse. There's a great choice, you know, that I could plant in a dry shade garden and use in mass um, and not have the deer prune it for me every year. So a little bit shrubbier growth, you'll see these will probably be some of the taller ones that we'll show up there in that two, maybe three foot tall, two to three feet wide range. But again, outstanding evergreen foliage. You can see the flower there in the picture. This would be blooming coming out of winter um, and some great smell is awesome as well. So these we call stinking hellebores. I wish they would have called them fragrant hellebores. That sounds more pleasant, right, than, than stinking. But it does smell good. Um, the other species that you'll find around is the Argutifolius, they call them Corsican hellebore. 
we will have some more of this in here pretty quick. Uh, we had some in already and they've sold out, but I put this one in intentionally because again, we were talking about foliage. I'm gonna have a very similar flower on a lot of the Corsican hellebores that you'll see on the right there. But the difference with the Pacific frost, I've got that beautiful silver variegation. So again, a little bit shrubbier plant, maybe just a little taller than most of the hybrids in that two, maybe two and a half foot tall range and wide, but it's got that outstanding foliage that I get to enjoy year round. White, silver, kind of green, just a little bit of pink sometimes on the new growth too is, is, is a really nice foliage. Um, if we go, you know, pause for a second, we kind of talked about pruning. You know, if I go back one to the, to the fetitus, and then we look at the Corsican hellebore, you know, those two again are, are, are that early springtime flower. I'm not gonna cut the foliage off of those. I wanna make sure this is clear. Those are the two types of hellebores. I'm not gonna walk out at the holidays and cut all my leaves off. I want to let those guys alone all winter, let them bloom in spring. Once my flowers dry, probably a little later spring to early summer, now, if I want to cut that back and let it uh, start over again, that's the time to do it. So that would be the difference with those two species. Um, now we'll look at just a couple of uh, collections because now with all the hybrids, um, you'll see on your list there, I have Niger, Orientalis, or kind of the two original species. But now most of these new varieties are, you know, are, are cross or hybrids, essentially crosses of different types that are put together. Um, we've went from you know, old hellebores always kind of had their, their flowers hanging down. You know, you could see the color, but it wasn't standing up and kind of facing you as a gardener where you could maybe enjoy the, the flower a little more. So that's the, the point, I think, a lot of a lot of these hybrids um, making varieties of A, different colors, nicer foliage, um, and again, flowers that stand more upright that I can see a little better in the garden time. Um, this is one series, the Ice and Roses. Um, it's got a great flowers. There's a couple of demos there. I'll grab you one. So you can see, you know, green foliage. This is one of the, the ice and roses red here with the, with the dark green foliage. Again, if I look at the crown, I don't have flowers coming out just yet. This is one that we would see starting to bloom uh, just about Christmas time. You know, the ice and roses, I can get red, I can get pink, I can get a white. The newer one is the Piketty with kind of the, the edge color on the flower. All of them are great growers, nice foliage, um, and a little bit smaller. You know, the, 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 the hybrid hellebores like these, I would expect maybe something 18 inches tall, maybe two feet wide on an older clump. And again, something I can uh, divide very easily and spread as well. If we look at some of the gold collection, um, these are a lot, a lot of varieties that came out here in the last decade or so um, and continue to get added to uh, one of our great local growers right here in Washington, Skagit Gardens uh, provides most of these for us. They're just, just a little north of us up in Mount Vernon um, and they do a great job uh, propagating these and, and selling them to the, to the nurseries in the area. Um, lots of options again for flower color. These are very nice and tidy plants. Some of these won't even get a foot tall, but again, easy evergreen perennials. I can kind of pick my flower color. I can pick my bloom time um, and also pick a foliage that I like. So this is probably the one that you would see blooming a little bit more like now. If, if we look at a couple of varieties in the gold collection, I'm going to see some buds coming out of my plants here pretty quick. This will get me some bloom uh, going into the holidays and then kind of going through that that midwinter time frame. So you'll see pink frost. Uh, it's got a little touch of that pink in there with the nice white. Uh, Ivory Prince is one of the all-time best sellers. If you like a nice bright white flower, a little lime green in there too, uh, that's an easy one to grow and a, and a very heavy bloomer. A couple more in the gold collection. Uh, Cinnamon Snow um, and Monte Cristo. I brought one here. So this is a Monte Cristo, and you can see I've got my bloom stock coming out. That's one that's already coming out to bloom uh, that we will have flowers on here pretty shortly. So again, earlier flower, I want a little color early, um, get a little bit earlier bloomer. Uh, Frost Kiss collection started coming out here just the last couple years. 
Um, I think some, these are some of the nicest ones. You can see the flowers stand very, very upright. I can get some darker colors. Um, and these have outstanding foliage. So if I grab, you know, something like this, if you can see that mottled leaf, I'll show you here once again when the slideshow is over, but that's going to have a very nice mottled foliage on it. Um, and again, a little bit later blooming, the frost kiss, you would start right around the holidays and then go all the way into March. So that would just be a little bit later to get our bud and bloom. Uh, you'll see Penny's pink, Pippa's purple. They give them all kinds of terrible names, I hate to say. Uh, those two have a nice ring to it. The other one's Anna's red, which doesn't quite fit the other two, but um, somebody's getting paid to name these things, so we'll let them do their thing. Uh, Winter Jewels um, is, is essentially a collection I probably started with about 15 years ago, and they continue to make more and more. I thought that was a pretty cool little collage you can see where they tucked a bunch of the cut flowers in there, just so you can see the variation um, and different things that are out there if you look for them. Uh, we tend to get a lot of winter jewels in right after the holidays. This is going to be your collection uh, that's going to be blooming real strong in that late January, February, March into April time frame. Uh, lots of doubles. I put a picture of the painted doubles on there because that's got some really cool flowers on it. Uh, these are closer to the ones that I mentioned at the beginning that I would have paid a small fortune for from Mr. Hinckley back in the day um, where I'm going to get some different speckling, some different color combinations. Again, all easy to grow, you know, nice short clumpy perennials. I still get the evergreen leaves, nothing changes. But to me, with this collection, you can probably personalize your gardening kind of taste a little better. You know, I like this color. I want to get a combination with this. And again, sometimes you'll see these just sold as a mix. You know, uh, buy a few of them, amass them together, and let the different color combinations kind of play off each other. Uh, lots of options out there uh, for the Winter Jewels collection. Uh, we'll finish with a couple of new ones uh, that just came in this year. Um, again, the, a little, couple of them are hard to say. Glenda's Gloss is the easy one to say with the two Gs. Uh, that's got a nice Picotee flower again. The flower stands nice and upright. A uh, Sally Shell, I think if we added Seashell and Seashore and something else, we'd have ourselves a tongue twister, but uh, we do have some Sally Shell in. Um, again, very nice flower, but if you look at those plants, when they're not in bloom, they've got beautiful variegation on the leaves. So again, an added interest all season with that winter flower. Uh, last couple, Sh Cheryl's Shine was the hardest one for me to say three times, but uh, Cheryl's Shine has got a nice light pink with a little bit of white. And then that Honey Hill Joy uh, is kind of fun. You know, that's a little denser one. Um, it's a kind of a unique color to me. It's got a little bit more of that yellow to lime green with the white and the flower, um, which you don't see on a lot of them, um, but that's a, a new one for us as well this year, so. So there's a few, I'm gonna turn the stop share off here, okay? Um, so I'm gonna show you just a couple here, just, just to make sure everybody saw. So I, this is what I'm talking about when I say that variegated foliage. If I put that right up to the screen, I know we got sun today, so it's a little bit glary, but I'll turn it here a little bit. If you can see, again, that lime green reticulation on top of the dark green, you know, that's a sweet leaf to look at in the garden. Um, in addition to getting the flower here pretty quick as well. So, so look for some cool variegation like that. And just as an example, just to make sure everybody saw it, so like this was the Monte Cristo, one of those gold collection hybrids. And again, I can see what's getting ready to bloom. If I look at this plant and I carefully peel away those top leaves, I can see my first big, huge budstock coming out right now. So, I mean, I'm going to have color on this um, here before we get into the holiday season and then last all the way through winter. There's even a couple, some of the earlier blooming ones. Uh, this is this is one I didn't put a picture in, but this is one called Diva. It's got a nice little light white flower, just a tiny little hint of pink on the back. But this one's blooming now. You know, this is one of those first ones on the hellebores that we would start to get color um, in November. Um, Jacob looks nice and green. That's a beautiful plant, nice and full. But again, if I carefully look into the middle here, you'll have to trust me because I can't shove it up to the lens, but you can see the first white flower bud coming right out of the crown right now. So I would have color on this little guy here in the next couple of weeks and start again through the holiday season. So just a little bit, a li little bit earlier. 
This is one that started to open. This is one of the new ones we just looked at called Cheryl Shine. So again, if I look at the leaves, I've got a very nice, hopefully you can see with the glare, you got a very nice variegated leaf. But again, if I look at that flower, you know, that's already opening up. I've got a very unique color. You can see the center of there starting to dry. Um, this is where we would eventually, we mentioned seeds. When this dries, it's gonna turn in all kinds of colors and then those seeds will mature and then that's what would drop into the ground if I wanted to, to get a little bit of self sow okay? Just to make sure we saw again, maybe this one we can see a little better. This is Penny's Pink. So this is one of the ones um, we have out of that Frost Kiss collection. So if I look at that again, I'm hoping if I block the sun, you can see that variegated leaf. Are we seeing that, Nicole? Okay, cool. Because that, to me, that's what's about all about plants. You know, I like, I like easy to grow things. You know, to hopefully talk to you folks about, get you to have something you'll have success with in your yard. But when we can add, you know, more and more seasons of interest to a plant, all the hellebores got great flowers. You know, depending on your taste in the winter. But now I've got something I can look at some really cool foliage on the garden the rest of the season as well. So check out those. That's Penny's Pink. That probably showed you, probably showed you enough. I brought a few plants in. Um, again, they're just starting to bloom. So this is the time of year, you know, if you're if you're into hellebores, it's one of my many addictions um, to come down, come down and take a look. You know, we've got quite a bit and we will continue to get plants in all through the winter time here and have a great selection to choose from um, all the way into next April. You come down to a you know, place like Sunnyside, ooh, I forgot about my hellebores. What do you have around, you know, 4th of July weekend? You're probably not even gonna find a plant here on the property or very few to choose from. But if we come down and shop, you know, now all the way through March, you're gonna maximize your selection and have quite a bit to choose from as well. So uh, most of them have great picture tags on them. You can see the flowers if they're not quite blooming yet. And you can certainly uh, take a look at the foliage as well because they do have that. Um, so there's a couple, couple, hopefully get you thinking about hellebores. Um, again, with all the classes we do here, um, we do a nice discount. So when you come down shopping, uh, starting today, all the way through uh, next Friday, just let us know at the cashier you were at our class and they'll hit a little magic button on our magic computer and you'll get your 20% off your hellebore purchase. So that's a great price. Uh, save a little bit of money and get some cool plants that we can still plant in the garden. A lot of people are like, it's too cold, it's winter. What am I gonna do? I can't plant. You can plant year round. We got 30 degrees last night, I got a nice frost. We still got fall color. If I can get a shovel in the ground and that rarely happens around here where you can't, then I can put a plant in. You get them in the ground now, you're gonna be much happier as we grow through the winter time. We get root development. We have a much nicer plant when we get into that next growing season. So don't hesitate to, to still get planting. Um, I'll just mention real quick, um, I get to wave goodbye to you after today here for a couple months. I'll be back uh, teaching again about mid-January. We'll start kicking on the 2021 list. We'll have on our website here pretty quick. But uh, I don't know if you've met Holly down here. Uh, she's one of our best employees at the, at the nursery here. She runs our houseplant department and seasonal department. She'll be teaching a class on houseplants uh, next Saturday. So make sure it's the time everyone's kind of hanging indoors a little bit more. Uh, she's awesome with houseplants. She's done this for a number of decades and got some great knowledge to help you with. So hopefully you'll join us for a houseplant class next Wednesday or next Saturday, excuse me. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole. We'll hopefully we'll do some questions here. Um, can you tell us again how we can get rid of aphids on our hellebores? Well, aphids, um, you know, aphids, white flies, we kind of would throw all that into one group. Um, you've got a number of different options. You know, the easiest thing to me, if, if, if I walked out at Christmas time, mine's starting to bloom and I wanted to remove the foliage like I talked about and I saw bugs on there, I clip all the leaves off, put it in the yard waste and you probably don't even have to spray. If you're finding those during the growing season, um, you can use a number of different things. I brought in the super insecticidal soap I showed a little bit earlier. You know, that would be very effective if I got this down, maybe sprayed once, wait seven, 10 days, hit it a second time, I'll catch the eggs and I'm, I'm gonna win. If you've got neem oil, um, there's certainly a lot of chemical type sprays that, that you could use as well. We, we, I try to recommend a lot of green things during, during my classes and with those, there's no reason to go buy, 
you know, murder, death, kill, systemic. You know, you can get something very safe and natural like the neem oil, insecticidal soap, bond neem. We could go on and on. There, there'd be quite a few choices. Excellent. Um, somebody has a hellebore that's planted under a roadie and it's never bloomed in the two years that they've had it. Do you have any ideas or suggestions? <laughs> Um, I would guess probably a little bit of fertilizer. Um, I, I would ask that person uh, if they put a lot of bark down maybe um, as mulch. Um, if we're heavy on the bark, we always need to add a little bit extra food. But rhododendron is very shallow rooted. So they, they work very well together. I've got hellebores near rhodes in my own yard, um, but I make sure to put a little extra food on that guy. The rhodes is gonna probably take up most of that surface a surface nutrient, and then we want to make sure that hellebore has got something. So try, you know, take your crown of your plant, put a nice little rim of food around that uh, here in the middle of winter, and then maybe reapply one more dose here later next spring. I think you'll have a much happier plant. And what kind of fertilizer do you recommend, not just for this situation, but for uh, hellebores in general? I would always use organic, um, especially here. This is one thing that I probably feed a little bit earlier than I would most perennials, obviously, because they're blooming in winter. Um, with the amount of rain we get, and a lot of people get in the winter, synthetic foods are going to flush right through your soil. So if I get something organic, this is our, our signature brand is EB Stone. This is the rose and flower food. I use this on all my perennials, my roses, a lot of my flowering uh, deciduous plants. That's a really easy food to put down. Um, nice thing with organic, you can get the measuring cup out and, you know, and, and do the cooking thing and measure your quarter cup or whatever you need. But you could, I literally go, oh, you get a big handful, you get a small handful, sprinkle it out there, cover it up, and then off you go. Very, very easy. Do slugs like the hellebore leaves? Uh, not usually, to be honest with you. I mean, hellebore, um, you know, I kind of chuckle if you if you want to learn some history, type in hellebore and look back to, you know, six centuries ago in England, they used to use it. I think number of kings used it to rid themselves of their wives, believe it or not. It's got a poisonous little bit in the root system, not the foliage, but um, they're, they're very resistant to most animals. I mean, you're not going to see deer browse on them. Um, I would not worry as much about slugs. Um, if you do see trails on them, uh, here and there, they might be crossing over that to get something else. I'd, I've never had a slug eat a hole in, in any of my hellebores at my place. Um, by chance, if they're starved and that's the only thing you've got for them to eat, you know, use a natural slug bait. Um, Sluggo is very easy to use. The iron phosphate is safer. The pets, the kids, uh, wildlife, and it's very effective on the slugs. Are all hellebores uh, deer tolerant or just those, uh, the ones you talked about, the, the stinking yeah, hellebores? It, the, yeah, they'll, they'll put hellebores on the, on the you know, I, I don't know if anything is deer proof. There's a few things that perhaps are, but uh, they'll put all that on the deer resistant list. I don't think you're ever going to have um, the deer browsing on the hellebore foliage. Excellent. Um, do the tags on all of these hellebore varieties, will they mention when this, when each specific variety yeah. bloomed? Yeah. In fact, I, I should say this, we're, we're, we should update it because we, we do this every year. Um, on our website, I still believe um, there is a kind of a calendar graph chart that will show you November to April, and it's going to have different sections shaded in when different collections bloom. That might help you choose your flower. But if you come down here, everything's got a tag on it. I'd say 99% of it even has a picture with the flower. And then we would just look right on there. It would tell you November to January, December through March. It would give you that, that three-month interval when they're in peak color. So we've got some questions, some confusion about the cutting back. Um, that depends specifically on the variety, right, and when yeah. it blooms. And yeah. you basically want to cut it when it's done blooming and... Well, the, 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 I would almost put it in two. If you have the Corsican or the Stinking Hellebore, and a lot of gardeners already have them or add them, you know, to me, those were a little shrubbier. And I may not ever prune that. I had Pacific Frost in my yard. I don't even think I touched it for over five years before I finally said, okay, let's get you cut back after, he's, after it's done blooming. So that would be the opposite. I'd be out there, you know, probably March, April, even early May, and I would be cutting it back some to let it start over again. The hybrids, you know, the Niger, the Orientalis, all those different ones that we showed there in the show, um, I would rather get rid of my foliage before it blooms. I'm not saying you have to, 
um, but at least get rid of some because if you you got an old hellebore, it's a big, thick clump of foliage. And yes, I see flowers popping out here and there. I would rather walk out in my yard in January and see nothing but a clump of flowers coming out of the ground and get rid of my bugs and start to plant over once a year. Um, so I would prune, you know, half of them if, if they're kind of that that Christmas Linton rose style, I would want to prune that probably right before they start flowering. If it's the species, the Corsican or their stinking, wait until they're done blooming a little later in spring, let them regrow over the summer, set their buds, and then you've got to bloom again the next year. And when you say cut back, how drastic? Are you just giving them a haircut or are you totally- Oh man, if I, I think, I, I don't have any leaves left on mine when I cut mine back. So these are, you know, again, these are young plants. I'm not going to send this home with you and say, go cut all the leaves off. We wait a year and do this next year. But literally, if this was in my garden, let, let me get a little fuller one here. Just one second. So here's one that's a little bit bushier. So this is one of those ice and roses. This is the red and it hasn't bloomed yet. But if I look at that plant, I'm going to take my pruners and I'm literally going to go all the way down above the soil level and I'm going to clip off any leaf that does not have a flower bud coming out on it. If you have these in your yard, it'll be pretty noticeable if you walk out and look at that. You know, if you typically have a hellebore and you're walking out in January and starting to see the first flowers, you know, just real carefully look at the crown. You know, maybe you pulled a couple leaves apart and said, oh yeah, here's all my flower buds. If you got an old clump, you know, I'll have 15 stalks of flowers coming out of here uh, right after Christmas. So at that point, I'm going to carefully peel those leaves off and I'm going to chop the whole thing back. And I'm not saying you have to, but I don't ever spray because I get rid of the leaves, which means I don't have the bugs on there in the winter. Um, and I want to open up and see the flower. You know, I see some hellebores are thick and healthy and beautiful, but you just don't see the flowers quite as much because we have so many leaves. So either get in, maybe you take every other one out if you're a little shy and don't want to take the whole thing back, take half of them out one year and see if you like the difference with the flower. The next year, okay, I see, I, that's an easy one. It's never gonna hurt the plant. And I, immediately after bloom, I start to get my fresh light green foliage back out and off we go for another season. So we get a lot of rain up here in the Pacific Northwest. And you know, some people have a lot of issues with standing water and not a lot of drainage. Do you have any tips on how to protect your hellebores besides basically moving them? Well, it, you know, we, we can't fight the soil condition. And if you've got hard pan clay and water puddling and have struggled um, with drainage, that's probably not the best plant for those areas. Um, I, you know, is it possible to raise the garden level up a little bit? Maybe for some um, is an option, transplanting a little bit higher and drier. Um, you can't fight, you know, mother nature sometimes. And unless we can improve the drainage, um, get the water channeled out of there somehow um, or improve our soil, you know, probably not the best spot. We would pick a different plant that could take a little bit more of a, of a wetter location than that. And uh, somebody asked if lime chips help keep the blight away. Uh, I know hellebores don't mind some alkalinity. Um, it's not that they have to have acid soil. They don't mind either, honestly. Um, I don't know that it would help keep the blight away. Um, to me, you know, cleaning out old foliage, keeping debris away from the crown, you know, typical disease uh, when we do this class in spring, you know, if you're into the kind of that integrated pest management, it's maybe not having to spray, but it's doing some cultural things that might help your chances of not getting it. So removing old leaves, making sure I got better sun location and not getting crowded out by other plants, um, better air, better light, all that stuff matters to probably help, help keep the blight down a little bit. Okay, I think we're starting to wrap up on questions here. Um, we kind of talked about hellebores being able to grow in pots. How long do you recommend those staying in a pot before you have to move them to a different location? Well, if, you know, my question if you were standing here would be how big's your pot? So um, that would be the number one um, is if it got some room to grow. I mean, they, they don't mind being root bound. It's not something you're going to plant one year and then have to deal with another year. It, you know, say if I've got a typical you know, 18 inch, 24 inch pot. I add a, you know, I add a thriller. I use hellebore and some other things for fillers. I get a couple spillers. You know, I'm not planning on probably redoing that whole container for probably three seasons. You know, I'm gonna be pretty happy um, without having to redo it. But again, if, if I've got a little tiny pot and I just grow a hellebore in it, 
you know, it'll let you know when it's when it when it's out of gas. You're probably going to go to the edge of the pot and feel a lot of solid roots. Maybe that next summer you're watering and the water's going right through. You can't seem to to keep it irrigated. Those would all be signs. Okay, we got to get that divided and put some of it back in or transplant it out into the landscape at that point. Does it matter if it's a ceramic pot versus plastic? It, it doesn't, you know, ceramic is obviously going to be uh, frost proof. If you buy the, the nicer pots like we carry, I would never have to replace it. Um, plastic at some point is going to probably crack or fade or, or uh, run, get run over or something. Um, you may end up losing it at some point, but um, it's not going to matter the, 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 you know, the, the, the condition of the container. Um, probably avoid uh, terracotta, if you were asking me, unless you're really good with sealers. Um, that's the one that will usually disintegrate and crack up here when we get cold. But plastic or, or frost-proof ceramic, either way. Is there a certain type of soil mix that uh, we need to be aware of? Uh, you don't need anything special. Um, you know, for us here, again, I think E.B. Stone Organics is the finest brand around. So we would always recommend the Edna's Best Potting Soil. If we're going to use a container, mixing it with other things, that's ideal. If I'm using it, if I'm planting them in my ground, I am always going to use the, the planting compost uh, from E.B. Stone. So I'm going to take a nice, dig a nice sized hole. I have my native dirt off to the side. I'm going to typically mix a third of that compost amendment with two thirds of my native dirt as a mixture in my hole, and then use an inch or two of that compost as a nice mulch uh, around the crown of that plant to get it started for the season. And can you remind us one more time, when's the best time to fertilize them? If, again, if, if you want to go maximum fertilizer, um, I would get them, you know, kind of right after the holidays, probably one of the first things to, to, to fertilize in the yard. So maybe I'm, when I cut mine back is when I feed them. So I walk out, you know, Christmas to New Year's. I'll, if the ground's not super frozen, if it is, I'll wait another week or two until it isn't. But I'll get my food in there, get it covered back up with compost after I cut the leaves down. And if, if, you know, for me, honestly, it's one time a year. I haven't had to go through and feed mine a second time because I mulch and I keep my soil pretty healthy. If it's struggling at all, you didn't get a lot of bloom on it, the leaves are off color, absolutely get it a second time there. And that maybe May to early June time frame, that will get you a nice flush of, of fresh foliage, <coughs> excuse me, over the summer months um, and help with that bud set on the crown for that next season bloom. Excellent. I think we've covered all the questions that have been submitted today. Um, if something comes up and you have a question later, we'd be happy to help you out and answer it. Shoot us an email at sunnysidenursery at msn.com. And this class is recorded. We're going to post it up on our website, on our classes page, so that you can go back, watch it again if you miss something or need a refresher. Um, and then hopefully we get to see you next weekend for our houseplant class. And then stay tuned. We'll be releasing our 2020 one class list in the next month or so and Trevor will be kicking off those classes I think the beginning of January yep. so um, we hope to see you all next weekend and if not have a good rest of the year and we'll see you in 2021. Go Bye. Hawks! Go Hawks!